Hi guys. Um, I am trying to be a little bit better at getting a thumbnail that will actually work. So forgive my starting out face. Um, this is the chapter chat for chapter four of Ellie Vicel's Night. Um, there are a few things that I want to talk about in this chapter chat. So I am, um, I don't know what my deal is today, but I'm feeling a little bit disorganized in my brain. I think it's the end of week two and um, it's just been kind of a lot making this transition and uh, and trying to anticipate what y'all are maybe needing to hear in these chapter chats. And so this next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get some feedback from all of you uh, to get a better sense as to whether or not it's helpful um, or if there are some specific things that I should cover in these chapter chats. If there's something that's coming up for you already, um, please leave a comment in the comments in YouTube and um, and I'll try to make some adjustments or go back and film some more if you have specific questions or if there are things that you need me to do in these chapter chats. I'm trying to not spend a lot of time talking about what's happening in the chapter, but instead um, just focus in on some of the more thematic stuff that's happening or draw your attention to things that I think help and relate to the purpose that Ellie Vaisal has for writing this particular memoir. So um, please comment or contact me or communicate with me in some way if there's something that you need for these chapter chats to be doing that they are not currently doing. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, chapter four. So in chapter four, um, Eliezer and his father have moved camps. They were in Auschwitz in chapter three. I didn't really talk about Auschwitz. You guys have a section in your web quest that will ask you to um, learn a little bit about Auschwitz. It's the most famous of the concentration camps. Um, but it wasn't the only camp. And so now they're in Buna where they will stay um, and be assigned their workshops and stuff. So you're seeing that happen um, at the beginning of chapter four that they have been moved. Um, Okay, so um, I think I'm going to try to organize this chapter chat by uh, purpose, Ellie Weissel's purposes. So um, in the preface, we talked about him having three. And the three purposes are to help us to understand what this experience was really like. And his idea of understanding was multi-part, right? And so it's yes to understand kind of the gruesome um, details of what it was like to be a prisoner in a concentration camp during the Holocaust, but also the understand the madness that the um, that the inmates experienced, right? And so, in terms of madness, by chapter four, I think we're starting starting to see the loss of we're seeing loss of faith and we're seeing that the Jewish inmates are not able to really recognize themselves. So there's a couple instances we've seen already where Eliezer watches his dad um, get like hit and he doesn't do anything. And so it's, and um, we've seen Madame Schachter get beat up and, um, uh, and the people in the cattle car just watch. And so it's these kinds of madness that Eliezer I think, is talking about that he's trying to show us. The madness that happens to kind of our moral code um, when we're experiencing tremendous fear. And uh, we start to see that happen more and more as we get further into the book. And now that we're right about chapter four, um, it starts to get particularly gruesome. We meet Eidek, um, and we see his cruelty. We start seeing the hangings. Um, and so we're starting to see the real brutality of people. Um, and we're starting to see how... Uh, Eliezer is responding to that. Um, callous in some situations um, and really devastated in others. So his purpose, um, one, to help us to understand, I think we see that reflected in a couple of ways. Uh, we see it reflected in the scene with the cauldron of soup. Um, this is one of my favorite scenes in this memoir it's hard for me to call it my favorite i think that that's probably not an appropriate word in my book it happens um on page 59 and page 60. um and what i love about this particular scene i'm just going to read a little section of it um 
He says, fear was greater than hunger. Suddenly, we saw the door of block 37 open slightly. A man appeared, crawling snake-like in the direction of the cauldrons. Hundreds of eyes were watching his every move. Hundreds of men were crawling with him, scraping their bodies with his on the stones. All hearts trembled, but mostly with envy. He was the one who had dared. He reached the first cauldron. Hearts were pounding harder. He had succeeded. Jealousy devoured us, consumed us. We never thought to admire him. Poor hero committing suicide for a ration or two or more of soup. In our minds, he was already dead. Um, that goes on for a while. I'm not going to read the whole section to you. But what I love about this is that um, the way that Eliezer writes this scene and many of these scenes, um, it feels like we are anticipating what's happening next in every single move. And the way that he builds the mood of suspense and anticipation makes me as a, re as a reader feel like I'm in that moment with him. And so I feel the anxiety in my stomach as I'm wondering what's going to happen next. And I think that, um, that that's tied really closely to his purpose of wanting to help us understand the descriptive and vivid detail that he uses and the way that he slowly walks us through these events step by step, telling us what he's seeing and what he's thinking and what they're thinking, what everybody's feeling, um, helps for us to kind of feel in that moment moment with him, which magnifies the shock and magnifies our own emotional reaction to help us to start to understand. And we see some more of that helping us to understand in the two scenes where there are hangings that are happening. Um, there are two hangings that happen in this chapter, but we also see that um, many hangings have occurred. In the first one, um, Eliezer explains after he watched it that, um, that, that on that evening, the soup tasted better than ever, um, which just gives us some insight into how callous, um, he's become to death, right? That they're watching people die every single day and death is just becoming kind of such a natural part of their everyday life. Um, that once they were done, he was like really looking forward to eating and the soup tasted really great. I think that he gives us that detail about himself um, in a really neutral way, which is surprising. I think that if I were that person, I would be kind of riddled with my own shame. Um, but he really wants for us to understand um, how much these people are no longer acting like how we think people should act or reacting how we think normal people would react to these sorts of things. So that's part of understanding too. The next hanging scene, um, which is of the Pipel, um, the young boy, he reacts really differently. Um, in this moment, uh, they're forced to kind of walk past this young boy. I and mean, then he explains the third rope was still moving. There are three people that are being hanged here. The child too light was still breathing. And so he remained for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red, his eyes not yet extinguished. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, for God's sake, where is God? And from within me, I heard a voice answer, where he is, this is where, hanging here from this gallows. That night, the soup tasted of corpses. Um, and so even though death in general has become an event that he's kind of normalized, um, there are some events in this story um, that are so beyond what is something that we can rec reconcile as people um, that even though death has become normalized, there are some that will stick out to him as, as that nature of madness that he talks about in the preface. Um, and so I think that he contrasts those two intentionally to show us just the magnitude of, of how far these Nazi soldiers were willing to go to make sure to push these inmates past their breaking point every chance they got. Um, 
So purpose number one, I um, also think that that lends us nicely to discussion of hope and faith, which is another way that he is changed quite dramatically. And we start to see that shift happen from three to four as well. Um, it's hard to talk about um, faith in chapter four without briefly talking about what happens in chapter three. Um, and in chapter three, the place where I think it's important to contrast um, is on page, I wanna say, I have it written in my notes somewhere, um, 45. It's on page 45, where Kiba Drummer is saying um, that God is testing us and he keeps singing hymns and he's like, we have to keep the faith, we have to keep the hope. Um, again, earlier on page 41, um, one of the, I don't really remember what they're called. Um, when they get into their block, the, the man who is in charge of their block, they say was a young Pole. Um, and he gives them this really powerful speech about the importance of holding on to hope and faith. And through these moments, um, there are some characters that are really starting or that are really trying to uphold that. Um, after we see um, the papel hanged, that hope and that faith is no longer there um, in the same way that it was before. There's also the character Stein, um, and Stein is holding on to hope and faith because he um, knows that his family is safe. He keeps asking about his family whenever people come in from Saget, um, and as soon as he hears the news that uh, his family has not survived, and that's the last time that Eliezer and his dad see him again, assuming that he's died because he has... Um, He's heard the news. And so that hope and that faith that is dwindling seems to be connected in some meaningful ways to these family bonds and this sense of community. So people are really attaching themselves to their family. We're starting to see that with Eliezer and his father's relationship. That will continue to be something that builds over the course of the memoir. Um, but we're starting to see um, a huge emphasis on faith, loss of faith, not only in God, but also loss of faith in humanity when we see these events, like what happened to Papel. Okay, so we're supposed to be understanding those things. Um, he also wants to pay respect for the people who um, who maybe didn't make it out. And, they're, and in these couple of chapters in chapter three with talking about that poll, Akiba Drummer and Stein. Um, I think that he's trying to name people who were impactful to him in some way. And we see a lot of this happening in chapter four. So those, although these are not big events, I think the fact that he um, names a bunch of people um, is particularly important. So that's happening on page 49 in my book. And I'm going to look at it. So here on page 49, down here at the bottom, he talks about um, Juliet, a Pole, Louis, a native of Holland, um, Hans, Frannick. Um, and these are just people that he briefly interacts with as they're working together. But he makes it a point to bring them in and to say their name. And I think that it's fair of us to assume that these are people who didn't make it out. He also talks about the young um, French girl who he ends up seeing years later who is kind to him when he gets beat up really badly by Eidek um, and she encourages him to be strong. So we see um, him making mentions of many people by name and talking about the people that he interacts with both good and bad interactions and I think that that's a way to um, to pay respect to, to the people who are kind and to name out and call out the people who are particularly brutal. And um, so that's um, purpose number two. And then his purpose number three is this idea of understanding so that um, history doesn't repeat itself. I don't, um, I don't know that he's doing anything specific for that other than all of the stuff that he's trying to make us understand. So um, showing us exactly what was happening and the separation and the cruelty and the dehumanization and continuing all of that. Um, I think the shock is intended to kind of penetrate our psyche in ways that are meaningful enough that we will... Um, that we will be mindful when we start to see the warning signs or be interested in investigating some of the warning signs and being more aware 
of what's actually um, happening behind the scenes or what happened in the 15 years before all of this stuff that allowed for it to happen. Um, okay, so I think that that's all I'm going to talk about for chapter four. Um, next week, I'm hoping to maybe add some additional videos, um, maybe where I do some close reads or talk through some stuff. Miss Brown has been doing some close reads and annotations. I'm going to try to link her uh, YouTube channel underneath this post and I want to put it on Google Classroom too if you guys want to go through and do some close reads. Um, she's annotating um, some pages in the PDF and I think that that could be really useful for some of you who want to just kind of dig into the language a little bit deeper or look more closely at passages um, as you're supplementing just your reading and journaling. Outside of that, um, we'll start and finish the second half next week. It goes pretty fast from here. So if you're having questions, please comment or reach out or if you're needing something from me in these um, chapter chats that you're not getting. I'm hope I'm willing to go back and re-record um, new ones for other chapters too. Just uh, make sure that you are leaving comments and communicating with me as best you can and I will uh, chat with you about chapter five.